When it comes to classifying main sequence stars, you've likely heard of the oh be a fine girl, kiss me kind of rhythm that you are taught in order to remember these main sequence stars in order from hottest to coldest. But why those letters? Why that order? It doesn't make any sense. So when I started to become an astrophysicist, I was just taught this by my professors. That you just go through this rhythm, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, and then you will remember the main sequence stars. I never really stopped to question why those letters and why that order. Looking at it, at first I thought there must be a structure to it, but the letters are not evenly spaced. Um, there's no obvious order to them. And the only real like thing indicator I kind of find was they're all in the like first part of the alphabet. Like we're not seeing like S, T, and Q and all those letters that we see towards the end, but why? Well, it turns out there's a good explanation for it as there is with most things. And we're gonna start with Edward Charles Pickings. He was, as a boy, really interested in the stars and astronomy, and he built his first telescope at age 12. In the 1890s, when you were classifying stars back then, they had a system where they would classify the stars in 22 categories from A to Q. And these stars were then classified based on the strength of the Bulma series absorption lines. Now, if you don't know what the Bulma series is, it is the absorption lines caused by atomic hydrogen. So essentially, they were just sorting the stars based on their hydrogen content. An interesting thing about the Bulma series is it has six like emission or like, absorption lines, depending on whether it's a gas or whether lights are shining through it. The first line, the reddest of these lines, is the hydrogen alpha line. And you might know this as the H alpha. So if you're taking pictures of a nebula and you're using an H alpha filter, then that is the first line in the Boltma series, um, which I thought was quite neat. But anyway, all the stars are sorted A to Q based on their hydrogen content or the strength of this bolt of these Boltma series peak. So around the turn of the century, around around 1900, just before actually, um, Pickings was tasked with creating the Henry Draper catalog. Now the Henry Draper catalog was named after a scientist called Henry Draper. He was in the 1840s, he was like a doctor and a chemist and a botanist. As, as back then, you just had like, multiple professions within science at the same time. He left quite a bit of money that was put into like a trust and that trust was then used to further science. And one of the tasks that this trust was paying for was to create a catalog of every single star in the night sky. Not just a specific type, not just a specific area, every single star in the night sky were to be catalogued as part of the Henry Draper catalog. Now, this is obviously a massive task and it's not something that Pickings could do on his own. So what he did, what he's hired, what he did was he hired a team for it. There were a group of men that during the night would take pictures and when you do it back then, this is, you, would, you would have these like photoreactive glass plates that you would put in at the uh, rear of the telescope and then you would manually open to expose and close again when you were done, replace the plate with a new one and you would keep going like that throughout the entire night, just move the telescope ever so slightly between each. This must have been painstaking work, <laughs> to be honest. Fun fact actually, here in, in Copenhagen we have, a, uh, we have a really old telescope actually from around this time that still has the adapter at the back where you would slot in these glass plates to, uh, to take pictures. And I've even seen some of the pictures, original pictures that were taken with this telescope, not the one used by Draper uh, for the Henry Draper catalog, but the one used here in Copenhagen, um, which is quite fun. But that's the side track. Um, basically, guys were taking pictures during the night, during the day. Um, Pekings had a team of women called the Howard Computers uh, that would then take these pictures they would do all the like, astrophysical calculations and, and then they would classify them. One of the women on this team was Annie Jump Cannon, and she was a remarkable woman. When she started out on this team, uh, in the first three years, she managed to classify a thousand stars in those three years. Toward the end of the work in 1913, she was able to classify 200 stars per hour. That is 18 seconds per star that is 
remarkable work. Um, and and Pekings will also as has also been quoted by by saying that 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 Cannon here she was the fastest in her field to classify and the most accurate to classify stars. By the end of her career, she's classified more than 350,000 stars, 300 variable stars, five novas, and a single binary. <laughs> so quite remarkable work. But if we go back in time a bit, when they began doing this classification work, they were beginning to disagree on the system that they wanted to use for the classification. Some people argued that the more complicated system would be better as you would retain more information where some people would argue for a simpler system that would make it faster to, to classify but of course would give you like less information about the individual stars. Canon she came up with a like a kind of like a compromise in between where we would use the existing A to Q system but we would like bin them together into only seven bins. So she would take all these stars that were previously calculated based on hydrogen content and would say we're going to bin them into fewer categories and then reorder them based on their temperature. And that's where the whole OB if I go kiss me series come from. That was that A to Q series rebinned and reordered based on temperature instead of hydrogen content. And that's why it seems kind of random. Now one other fun thing. Now, since I know a lot of you guys watching this video is going to be coming from the Elite Dangerous community, there are some out there, probably already in the comments, that said, what about KGB Foam? <laughs> and, and for those who don't know, there is an alternative way to remember the main sequence stars. You have the OBF angle Kiss Me, we've talked about that already, but you also have KGB Foam. And this was actually popularized by the gaming community around the game Elite Dangerous, which is a space sim uh, game. I assume a lot of you guys will know it. I actually thought this came from outside the Elite community, but it's actually created inside the community as a way to remember the main sequence stars. And the reason why it's so important is because you can get fuel from main sequence stars in the game, which you can't from other types. So that's why it's so important to be able to remember those. And some people, it was, for some people, it was just easier to remember KGB foam because it's a very visual thing compared to this OB a fine girl kiss me. Personally, I lean towards the OB a fine girl kiss me over KGB foam. Now, if you like Canon and Pekings in this story, have a aspiring astrophysicist or astrophotographer in you, and maybe you don't know how to get started. Maybe you already been taking pictures for a while. I would like to introduce you to the Cosmic Field Guide. This is a book that I've written that has a host of information for people, regardless of whether you are brand new to astrophotography or whether you are an experienced photographer. One of the cool things in the book is there's all these challenges where they are leveled into five different categories, five different levels. So regardless of whether you are brand new or whether you're experienced, there are some challenges in here and each challenge is designed to introduce you to new techniques, new tools, uh, new equipment. Um, so even depending on where you level are, you can jump in, you can begin to do the challenges and you can use those as a curated way to improve your astrophotography game. Check it out on deepspacebooks.com. Either decay directly down to its ground state, or it can decay down first to its third level, and then again, these tidal telescopes will often be constructed of a relatively large optical tube with a big main mirror at the, uh, at the 